I'll admit, it's not the access route that it used to be. But uh, if I want to get down and look in there, without scrambling over a large rock, and I mean scrambling, this is the way to go. All right, managed to get through that. Got whipped by a narrow branch across the left eyeball. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, this doesn't continue anymore. <laughs> there is a lookout viewpoint a little bit further over there. But um, doesn't exist, the, the access route doesn't exist anymore. And as you can see, the railing, the railing ends here. And from now, I've got to go down this way to get to the river. So here we go. Well, things have changed slightly since I was here last week. Uh, you can see all this bamboo here. This is all fallen down because of the snow that we had. Still patches of snow. And uh, this bamboo pole crossing the water, that wasn't here last week either. <clears throat> also, I came here early. Um, judging by the weather report, they were saying that it would start clearing up here around seven o'clock in the morning. However, that was out in my city where I live and here, almost an hour's drive away into the mountains, it is still cloudy. And that's because the mountains have clouds resting over the tops of them. And in fact, about 50 meters up from here, there is fresh snow. <laughs> There's that uh, observation deck. I don't know when this place was popular to visit, but it uh, looks like it hasn't been for a while. I'll take a few photos. Well, good morning fans of music and the great outdoors. This is Peter Sko from Music is a Journey. Thought I'd do something a little different today. Uh, this is for my friend Nick over in Wales. Nick has become one of my regular commenters on my videos. I think he watches and comments on pretty much all of them here the last few months. And he has his own channel called During the Meanwhiles. Now, Nick's channel is mostly about outdoor photography. He goes out to the forests, to the seashores, captures lots of beautiful scenery. He takes you along on his trips. He tells you about what's going on and he shows you some of the photographs. Sometimes he's sitting at home and he's talking about an outing he went on recently and explaining about the photographs. He also tests equipment or tells you how to take care of your equipment. So if you're into outdoor photography, Nick has a lot of great stuff to tell you about on his channel. That's during the meanwhile. I'll put a link in the description, as they say. So Nick's uh, channel is mostly about photography, but he does occasionally also do some videos about music. And he's talked about some of his favorite albums, uh, various videos, not so many so far. However, um, Nick has a bit of a of a, a bit of a difficulty right now. He has some health issues, and they are kind of preventing him from getting outdoors as much as he'd like. Uh, and he would still like to keep doing videos. And of course, testing equipment is one way to go about doing it. But he's also thinking to do some more videos about music if his viewers are okay with that. And. Uh, as much as I enjoy his photography videos, I too also don't get out as much as I used to. Even now, I basically had to steal some time from the morning after getting about three hours sleep and then driving an hour out here to the mountains just to visit this location 
uh, to get a few photographs before I, you know, scooch on back home again. So even though I'm, I'm not suffering from health issues, I am also experiencing the same thing. I simply cannot get out to photograph as much as I used to. In fact, it used to be I was out almost every month, hiking in the mountains, staying overnight, or two, three days in the mountains, and now I'm lucky if I can get out for three or four hours in the early morning. <laughs> So anyway, um, Nick, uh, a few weeks back, he did a video on five cool albums. And uh, he welcomed me to do a video of my own on five albums that I think are really cool. And so I thought that was uh, a really nice idea. And I started to think about it because cool albums, uh, does this mean my favorite albums? Does this mean albums that I think are great all the way through? Or is there something more to it? Now I know Nick is a big fan of Queen and Uriah Heep, so I expected that Nick was probably going to be talking about albums by those bands as well as some of his other favorites. However, his actual video really surprised me because I did not expect any of his choices. By the time I saw his video, I would already started thinking of my choices and uh, I've been kind of tossing it up and down between six, um, you know, six different albums that I have to narrow down to five. And, one of them, I really, really like it, but I've talked about it in about three of my more recent videos from December and January, and I, I really thought I shouldn't talk about it again. Otherwise, people who are new to my channel might think that I talk about that album in every video. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, make my selection of five and then put in an honorable mention. And I'm not sure if that one album should be the one with the honorable mention or if it should be one that I think is just a little less cool, but uh, I'll think about that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm not going to sit here and make this video all day. I'm going to go back home and finish it up there. So I, I hope you enjoyed the scenery here this morning. Nick, I was especially thinking of you. That's why I, I brought the microphone along. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you back in, back in the office. <laughs> all right. Well, all right then, here we are back in the home studio, and I've had a little more time to think about it. I've decided no honorable mentions. I'm just going to speak about the first five albums that came to my mind when I want to think about what are some five cool albums. So, <laughs> here we go once again. I do really want to mention this one, and maybe, maybe for the last time this year. This is Lee Aaron's album, Beautiful Things, from 2004. I'm going to tell you two reasons why I think each of these albums are cool and two reasons why I think this album is really cool. One of them is because I like the music. I like pretty much every song on here. This is an album that is a mix of jazz covers, some blues, a little bit of gospel mixed in, a touch of country, and some contemporary female... I'm not going to call it pop. It's, it's, too, it's too good. To be just regular pop music. Um, this is a unique album in her catalog because Lee Aaron was known in the 1980s as a singer of, of heavy metal, hard rock, pop rock, and in the 1990s she struck out as an independent and recorded a couple of alternative rock albums which were very good but were commercially unsuccessful causing her to have to declare bankruptcy because she had taken a loan out originally to be independent to have an independent label and she fell into a, a period of uh, I guess it was a kind of a depression anyway like what am I going to do the career I've been working for carving out for myself for the last 15 years or so is now suddenly um, up in limbo and she was singing to some jazz records at home and one of her friends heard her and said why don't you try singing jazz and she thought that's a great idea she put together a band they did a jazz covers album which was very much a jazz covers album but this album here is her teaming up with a guitarist as she had always done in the past and then writing a bunch of new material, new original material, as well as doing some covers and some jazz arrangements. And I just find that this album is, of all her albums, even though I like a lot of her music a lot, uh, this album here, just every track pretty much uh, appeals to me. And uh, for that and for the story behind it, this is one of my picks as a cool album. And in fact, when I was first thinking, gee, what would I pick for my first five, uh, for five cool albums, I happened to be listening to this the next morning and thought, well, 
jazz is cool, blues is cool. I mean, both jazz and blues are inherently cool, so therefore this album must be cool. <laughs> so there it is. So keeping in mind the jazz and blues theme, I almost immediately thought of the next album that I thought would be a cool album to think about. And the more I thought about it, the cooler I thought it was. So uh, rather than dig the CD out of the box, I just went and grabbed this off the shelf. No, this is not vinyl. This is a concert program for Aerosmith's permanent vacation back in 1987. There we go some pics inside. Anyway, the reason why I think this album is cool, once again, two reasons. First of all, I do really like the music. Um, but before I talk about that, I want to get into the story behind it. Of course, Aerosmith were a big, big band in the 1970s. They, uh, through their success, I guess, um, it, it, it led to, you know, drug abuse and there was infighting between the band members, well, particularly Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Great songwriting team but also known as the toxic twins because they're always at each other's throats and it led to joe perry eventually leaving the band and then finally um who was it uh was it brad whitford also leaving the band and in the end finally aerosmith reached a point where there just wasn't anything happening and the manager thought well the only way we can get over this is if we get steve and joe talking together again and so he arranged for them to meet and apparently for the first hour or so, they did nothing but bicker and accuse each other of whatever in the past. And then finally the manager said, now that we're done talking about the past, can we talk about the future? And the two men agreed they could. And so they re uh, reconvened. They put the original lineup of Aerosmith back together again. And they cut an album with Ted Templeton producing. And it was done with mirrors, which was kind of just an uh, it was a decent hard rock album, but it wasn't really Aerosmith. So they, uh, one of the big things they had to do now that they got the band back together was to get off the drugs. So everybody clean up, everybody go into rehab, get off the drugs. Uh, that was a big step. And then they went up to Vancouver to Bruce Fairburn. Now Bruce Fairburn had just recently had monstrous success with Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet. And of course, previously with the first four albums of Loverboy, as well as some other stuff. So they teamed up with him and boy oh boy did they ever come up with a really cool album. Uh, in fact there's something in here that even talks about just how cool this album is. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. Uh, it says cool feels like an iceberg has just slipped down your spine. <laughs> I remember that when I first you know read this back in 87 that line has stuck with me ever since so for me this album always has that cool feel but what I like about it is this is 1987. What's big in 1987? Glam metal. Everybody out there. Poison, Motley Crue, Rat, Cinderella, and all these other new bands coming out. Britney Fox and uh, I don't remember all the uh, Preboy Floyd, all these other people. Even, even White Snake was going for a glam metal look. Judas Priest were going for a glam metal look. And who were one of the original glam metal bands, or at least glam rock bands of the 70s? Well, Aerosmith was certainly a part of it back then. So, you know, this would have been an opportunity for somebody to say, hey, glam metal is really big right now. You guys kicked it off. Why don't you join up with all those young bands and show them how to do it? And they could have tried to make Aerosmith do a glam metal album, or at least a traditional Aerosmith album, but that is not what happened. Bruce Fairburn had them. First of all, there is no metal guitars on here. This is a blues rock band guitar sound. All right, this is more like the Rolling Stones, which often has been said to be the fathers of Aerosmith in a way. Yeah, they have that. They've got harmonica, they've got saxophones, there's a bit of clarinet, there's other horns coming in there. They've got the acoustic bluesy guitar and tracks. You've got the, the really rockin' tracks that are more like um, Magic Touch, for example. That could have been a hair metal track if you just changed the guitar sounds. Angel, the big power ballad, which could have been a hair metal, a glam metal power ballad if you changed the guitar sounds. But they've also got Hangman Jury and St. John, which are both very bluesy tracks. You've got tracks like uh, Ragdoll and uh, Girl Keeps Coming Apart, as well as Dude Looks Like a Lady. You've got the brass going and 
there's just such a variety of stuff on this album that that really brings out the coolness of, of having brass in rock and having blues in rock and just really cool songs. Um, and it is probably, in a way, I think one of their most original albums because they really made a comeback with this album here, Permanent Vacation. This is the album that landed them back up in the top again and Aerosmith were once more a name to be reckoned with. So that is why I think Permanent Vacation is such a cool album. Okay. Next up is this one here. This is Jefferson Airplane's third album after bathing at Baxter's. Why is this album cool? Well, there are some notes inside the CD here, and I'm not going to dig them out now, but there are some notes in here that talk about the previous album, Surrealistic Pillow. Put them way up in the charts with songs like Somebody to Love and uh, White Rabbit. Both songs, actually, that Gray Slick had brought with her to the band from her previous band. Um, Gray Slick joining up with Jefferson Airplane for the Surrealistic Pillow album. So, the cool thing is that after the band had achieved big commercial success <laughs> with those two songs, the notes in here say that the band, rather than pursue that commercial success further, took a big swan dive back into the underground. And that image of its own, I just thought was really cool. This album is, I wouldn't say it's Sgt. Pepper's, but it follows that same kind of thinking, like we're going to do something quite different from what we've previously done. There are five tracks on here, but each track is comprised of two individual tracks, um, except for the first one, which actually has three, because the second one is a small package of value will come to you shortly, which is basically a pastiche of various percussion and a harpsichord playing mixed in with all sorts of voices, making silly remarks and funny accents and farting sounds and whatever. But um, th the rest of the tracks on here, the actual songs, they're really, really cool. I love this. The Ballad of You, Me and Pooh Neal is a great start. Young Girl Sunday Blues is wonderful. The War is Over, the second track with Martha and Wild Time. Wild Time is great. I love Martha too. Um, one thing I really love about this album is that it feels like it's a live recording. Not like live in concert, but live in the studio. Because there are vocal harmonies that aren't perfectly harmonized. There are vocalizations, <laughs> words or parts that seem to be just spontaneously thrown in, like when Marty Balin suddenly goes, armadillo in one part. Like, I don't think they sat down and wrote, and in this part here, Marty, you're going to say armadillo. I think that was totally spontaneous. Some of Grace Slick's uh, contributions seem to be just her just giving it at that moment. And um, I kind of feel like a lot of it is ad lib. Um, what else? Uh, some of the, the mu musicianship, some of the playing in here also feels like the idea is there. It's occasionally a little bit off or not quite right, but it, it gives it that live in-studio feel. And I feel that there is just so much what um, uh, confidence in the band to deliver their idea. It, it's as if they grabbed various pieces and strapped them all together with vine and made this tremendous raft that looked really rickety and, you know, cast it out onto questionable waters, but they set forth with confidence in their hearts uh, to deliver their message. It's that kind of a feeling anyway. And um, pretty much every track on here I like. I will admit that the extend, extended instrumental of Spare Change is a little bit random and, and uh, wandering in places. And the other day when I listened to it, just to reaffirm my opinion, I actually dozed off Granted, I was riding the train back on the af in the afternoon with the sun shining through the window. That probably helped. But anyway, I, I love what they did with this album. It is my favorite Jefferson Airplane album. I know a lot of people prefer Crown of Creation, the one that came after that. But this is my pick. And I just think it's really cool because, again, they looked at their chart success and they just went, okay, now we're going to do what we want to do again. <laughs> and this actually, um, critics at the time, some people didn't like it because there was no somebody to love on here. But a lot of other critics said that... Um, 
this was a really bold album and this was a, a fantastic effort by an American band, one of the best American bands, if not the best at the time. And uh, someone even said it's kind of like Sgt. Pepper's and that you need to really listen to it and get into it. So after bathing at Baxter's. So my number four pick for a really cool album, this is... The Exile in the Kingdom by Jeff Martin. Now, Jeff Martin was and is a member of the Tea Party. The Tea Party started out in the early 90s. They were very strongly influenced by Led Zeppelin, but rapidly developed into a kind of uh, hard rock, blues, folky type, Led Zeppelin type band, but with extra effort on the Eastern instrument side. And then they suddenly switched over to incorporate a whole bunch of industrial elements. And then after that, tried to settle out how, where the industrial should fit in, where the Eastern should fit in, and where all their different elements should fit together. And uh, finally eased back on the industrial stuff. But they, they came to a point, okay, so they were basically given free reign to do whatever they wanted in the studios. However, as the band's popularity increased, that would be increased in Canada, Australia, and in Europe, not in the US. Um, as their popularity increased, the record labels were kind of leaning in on them and thinking, maybe we should get you guys to write an album that's more suitable for the American market. And their manager always stood between them, the band, and the labels and held them off and said, let the band do what they want. Let them do it their way because they're achieving success by doing it their way. But their manager suddenly passed away, um, suddenly died, and there was nothing to stop the labels coming in and saying, all right, let's see what happens if you guys write an album that is a little bit more for the American market. And they went off, I think it was with, was it with Bob Rock? They recorded off in Hawaii and they made an album called Seven Circles, their seventh album, which was a very good album. It's a very heavy album. Um, the industrial and Eastern elements, again, are scaled back. The Led Zeppelin influences are scaled back and it focuses mostly being on a really heavy album to appeal to that mid 2000s American market. And Jeff Martin felt at the time, um, the recording seemed to have gone very well. Certainly, um, Stuart Chatwood, the bass player, I think even Jeff Burroughs, the drummer, both of them had very fine things to say about the recording sessions, how, how well everything well went. But uh, at the end, Jeff really started to feel that he had compromised himself, that he had tried too much to write for what the, the label wanted or for a, a particular market rather than what he really truly felt like writing as he had done up until now. And um, he felt he needed some time off from the band. They had been touring so much and recording so much, so he needed a break. And then he just really felt like, I don't know if I can go back to writing music again. So he spoke to his friend Roy Harper and Roy said, why don't you just come to Ireland? <laughs> and so Jeff and his wife packed up and they went to Ireland and they moved out on a, on a spit of rock sticking out into the ocean which was known locally as the kingdom. And uh, there he found the inspiration to begin writing music again. And so that is the music that comes out on this album here. He did record a live album in Dublin. Um, and then this was his first true solo studio record. The opening track, World is Calling, is just a really powerful one. It's heavy, but it has the orchestration in it. It has the Eastern instrument, Eastern percussion in it. It has even like, um. Uh, like a, a Arabic guy doing a kind of chanting in, in one part. Uh, it's just such a powerful, powerful piece. The second to last track called The Kingdom has a re repeating melody, first on guitar and then later on with a choir actually all singing together. And it's really beautiful. It's, it's almost a religious feeling type song, especially when he says The Kingdom's Calling, but he's talking about this piece of Ireland here that's calling, The Kingdom's Calling You. But, um, and all the tracks in between, it is mostly an acoustic album, so there are a lot of acoustic tracks. He does bring in some of his acoustic Eastern instruments, um, but overall, it's just a really cool album as his first solo effort, and the whole story about him running away to Ireland and finding that he could write music again is really cool. The problem, of course, was that the other two band members didn't expect that he would suddenly just take off. They thought the Tea Party was taking a break, and then next thing you know, uh, Jeff Martin is running off to Ireland and doing a solo album, and the other guys are like, what, 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 what the F? 
what's going on here. So it actually led, you know, for some bad blood between them for a little while. But they patched things up around 2011 and they've recorded a couple of albums since then. However, Jeff has been living in Perth, Australia, um, home of his wife, for the last many, many years. So it's been really difficult for the Tea Party to keep going with the other two members still living in Canada. But nevertheless, a cool album. But uh, the other one I want to mention is this one here, Z2. This is by Devin Townsend. You know, around 2006 or so, he did an album called Ziltoid. And that was pretty much uh, Ziltoid the Omniscient. And that was pretty much Devin at home doing practically everything by himself. I think a couple of his buddies from his Devin Townsend band uh, contributed a little bit. But it's mostly him doing guitars, bass, keyboards, all vocals, all spoken voices, and uh, having a drum machine. But he always wanted to make a sequel to the story, and so that's it here, Z2. Um, and why this is so fantastic is because he really went all out on the budget for this. So uh, let's see here. So we've got like uh, this. These little characters here are the Poozers. Here's Ziltoid over here. The whole story is about uh, this alien who finds that... Um, oh, there we go. I think that is the... There's actually two two albums here. The other one is the Devon Townsend Project album. Ah, here we go. Here's the Ziltoid side. <laughs> this one over here. And this is the uh, Devon Townsend Project side. So two albums together. No, it was about this alien who found that uh, Earth's coffee was the best uh, type of fuel for his space vessel. I'm knocking stuff over here, finally. And, um, yeah, a really goofy idea. And then he... He gets pissed off uh, because uh, the Earth defeated him or something, and then he went out to this, you know, planet smasher type creature and wanted the planet smasher to blow up a planet for him, and he wouldn't do it. Um, anyway, it's just a, a really weird, goofy story. But he he did a follow up with Z two, and this is Ziltoid. Um, there's this queen of the the galaxy. Um, Ziltoid steals one of her poozers goes to Earth, uh, is hailed as a hero <laughs> because he's like a guitar hero or something like this. The Poozer escapes, goes back, tells the Queen about the coffee, and then she decides she's going to invade the Earth and steal all of their coffee. And then Ziltoid is supposed to have the secret to defeat the Queen, but he actually tricks the humans and then says that he's going to escape. And it's such a dramatic story. The songs on here are pretty cool. There are a couple of really great ones. The one thing about Devin Townsend that no matter how good the music is, the thing that always puts me off a little bit is his production is like this big wall of sound over the top kind of approach. But uh, nevertheless, it does work here. But what makes this really, really cool is that um, we've got voice actors doing the parts of the different characters, doing the Queen and doing Captain Spectacular and doing, a, I think Devin's doing Ziltoid and um, the Planet Smasher. And then we've got Bill Courage doing the narration, and I know Bill Courage's voice as a narrator from my childhood. And there's a lot of humor in here, there's um, a lot of weirdness, and it is just such an over-the-top thing, and it was later on performed live with a real puppet, <laughs> because he was really into that, that Dark Crystal movie when he was young, so... He wanted to do a kind of, you know, thing like that. Anyway, it, I remember one of his comments was that um, he wanted to put so much into it, partly for the sake of that someday in the future, somebody would think it was really incredible somebody did something like that. So I really like that attitude, like, you know, damn the torpedoes, we are just going to sink everything into it and make this thing a big, big deal. And it's a pretty cool album. Yeah, so that's Devin Townsend Z2. So there you go, those are five very cool albums for me. Uh, Lee Aaron's Beautiful Things, Aerosmith's Permanent Vacation, after Bathing at Baxter's by Jefferson Airplane, uh, The Exile in the Kingdom by Jeff Martin, and Z2 by Devin Townsend. Okay, that's it. That's my five cool albums, that the first ones that popped to my mind. So once again, uh, if you're interested in checking out some nice photography, good bit of Welsh humor, and maybe some videos about music as well, pop on over to 
during the mean whilst and just see what he's up to. Probably we'll see more music videos from him. Hopefully his health will turn around and he'll get back out with his camera again because I think that's what he loves doing best. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Catch you in the next video. Bye.